everyone, and welcome to Word on the Street. My name is Cyril the Summers McGee, and I'm the founder and CEO of Workplace Change, a human resources firm located in the infamous Portland, Oregon. Today, I'm going to be talking with a long-term client, Burgerville. Uh, I've been working with Burgerville for over a year, and we're going to explore COVID, civil unrest. We're going to talk about wildfires. We're going to talk about you know organizational staff morale. And we're also gonna explore how do they make their food so dang delicious, okay? I don't know if you've had those waffle fries or that, that fish sandwich. What is that? Um, is that talibut, halibut? Is that, is that the word? I mean, it is fantastic, all right? So we're gonna talk about all things Burgerville today. Joining me is Katie Reardon. Katie is the Chief Operating Officer at Burgerville, and I actually didn't meet Katie at Burgerville. We met well before that, so I actually want to give Katie a bit of space to explore both, you know, share with folks, what, who is Burgerville? What makes Burgerville so special? And then what's been your journey to get to Burgerville? Well, I'm super excited to be here today, so thank you very much for the invitation. It's actually quite heartfelt that I get to sit here with you because we did meet many moons ago. I feel like some lifetimes ago, way pre-COVID. <laughs> way so, pre-COVID. So, okay, there's that. Um, so, Burgerville, yeah, I mean, honestly, I think what makes our food so dang delicious, which is what you sort of ended on, but I'll start with, is the fact that we are a local, sustainably focused, hometown favorite. I mean, Burgerville is a 40 chain, 40 location uh, Pacific Northwest focus chain between Oregon and Washington. We've been here for about 60 years. It's our 60th birthday this year. Oh my gosh, that's Huge. right. I know. We got to bring back Sundays and cones because those seem to be the favorites. Um, but yeah, we're a hometown favorite. I think, you know, one of the things that makes us special and unique is the fact that our supply chain is within three to 400 miles of every location between Oregon and Washington. So it keeps all of our ingredients fresh, our supply chain healthy, and honestly, we also have a pretty rad in-house chef and she makes all the treats, so. She is rad. Yeah. I love chef. Right on. So what brought you to Burgerville? How'd you, how'd you land at BV? I know, it's crazy, right? Um, Cause I met you at Nike. Yes, I Making know. dope socks, I right? Know. So, yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. I've had a pretty diverse career and I would say background. Um, born and raised here in Portland, fourth generation Oregonian. Didn't really know when I was growing up, you know, grew up around these big brands like Nike and Columbia, um, but never really knew that there was a career path into them when I was growing up. Um, about well, 15, 20 years ago, decided that I wanted to really step out of the Pacific Northwest and go and adventure and explore other parts of the US and the world and started to pursue some different educational interests around international business and diplomacy. And honestly, that took me down a variety of paths. So I grew up in restaurants and bars, you know, in my teens and 20s, but then took a pretty solid, I don't know, call it an about face or a focus to retail and design and product management and supply chain. Yeah. Um, started working with companies like Banana Republic, then worked for Columbia, and then came back this way, or came back this way for Columbia, and then transitioned to Nike. So yeah. about six years ago, joined the Nike team, seven years almost now, wow. and then left last December to join Burgerville as their COO. Yeah, yeah. You know, that transition for me was super exciting. Part of the reason why I made the transition to food in general was that I had loved creating brands and I had loved working for um, brands that had really interesting insights and unique products to create. Mm -hmm. And food is one of those, right? It's yes. like the thing that's like the heart and the soul for people. It's where we break bread. It's how we come together. It's how we build community. And about four years ago, um, a I co-founded a business with my business partner, Michelle Batista, here in Portland called the Nightwood Society. Yeah. And we were food focused. We had an event space and a creative studio, and we were really interested in taking our skill set of creating product and design and supply chain for apparel and footwear companies and pivoting towards food. Mm -hmm. um, you know, food is also not only is it the thing where communities come are come together and break bread, but it's also an avenue for economic development, especially here in the Pacific Northwest. Right. Mm -hmm. And when I met with Burgerville, they were really interested in finding some new creative strategy partners yeah. to help them take Burgerville to a new place. 
So we joined their team originally as consultants about two years ago, mm -hmm. and then both Michelle and I went in-house about a year ago. She as the creative director and myself as the COO. Right on. And it's been, I mean, we've been making history ever since, right? Because I started my work with Burgerville nearly 18 months ago mm -hmm. now, and it was as a result of them basically saying, we want to reimagine the way in which we go about people and culture inside Burgerville. And I said, sign me up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So who knew that we would then, you know, endure so many things in 2020, um, which has been hmm, 2020 has been crazy for everybody. But we're going to talk about just some of the things that did happen through 2020. I, I actually want to ask you, what was 2020 like at Burgerville from your perspective? Because when, when I got to, to BV, you know, people were mostly talking about how to make sure that the workforce felt um, uh, appreciated and how to make sure that they had the supports and the, and the, the structure to be able to thrive and they, and they have career pathways and things of that nature. Like mm -hmm. that's what we were talking about on the front end. And we made, we built some of those things. We, we, we explored different minimum wage, you know, approaches to entry level, um, compensation at BV. We did a, a lot of really cool stuff. And as we were doing that cool stuff and, and new, uh, classifications and things to get, that gets me excited, right? These things get me excited. Um, and in the midst of that, March, picture this, <laughs> March 2020, mm -hmm. all of a sudden the world changed. And I just wanna just, what, what, what's your vantage point? From your vantage point, from the ops vantage point, what happened in 2020 at Burgerville when COVID descended upon the US? Yeah. It's, it's crazy, right? It's, I mean, it's a time warp. <laughs> First of all, I feel like this year has been 10. I have definitely aged this year for sure. I've got new wrinkles to attest to it. Me too. Um, right? And one of the things that I, I, you know, how I would answer your question is the world of Burgerville in 2020 was really one where we came into the year with a brand new vision. Yeah. So our vision is to make the Pacific Northwest the healthiest region on the planet. And Burgerville's longtime mission has been served with love. Yes. So when we came into 2020, having those two amazing anchor points helped us rally around whatever decision we had to make. Right. If we did not have the strength of a sound vision and mission, I think being a purpose-driven organization would have been very difficult to react from. That's right. To stay proactive to think of all of the options that you have in front of you and to start to honestly choose your own adventure. Like which path are you gonna take? There's a fork in every road here. That's right. And many of those roads were unknown, mm -hmm. especially in the early days. I mean, I feel like we're, in, back in the day of COVID, it was nine months ago. Nine months ago. <laughs> so for, for most businesses mm -hmm. you know, in the US. So for me, um, I think for Burgerville, really we stayed proactive. Right. We started to ask really challenging questions day one we started to mobilize and not just mobilize as a home office or an executive team, but all levels of the organization from our crew um, level employees all the way on up to our CEO, Jill Taylor. And having that level of, I think, collaboration and comprehensive looking across the entire organization enabled us to then go back to our vision and mission, scrap our old plans, right? Re write new ones and honestly continue to iterate as we went. So I think if anything, what I would say for Burgerville is it's been a very, very um, proactive culture, mobilized culture, and authentic to who we are in terms of our vision and mission. Absolutely. So let's go into some of the details of some of those, those challenging nights mm -hmm. and weekends, many, oh. many for weeks <laughs> in perpetuity. I, I remember telling Liz, who was then the HR director, because when, when I came and joined um, Burgerville, it was in an interim capacity serving as the interim senior vice president of human resources. So I'm coming in and I'm, and I'm talking to you, I'm talking to Jill, the CEO, I'm talking to Tasha, chief of staff, I'm talking to Liz, HR director. And we're basically, you know, the world stopped. Do you recall, do you remember the world just kind of stopped yeah. spinning? Yeah. People stopped going anywhere, right? Um, we were experiencing like, who are essential workers? Mm -hmm. do, do we stay open? Do we have to close? The dining rooms close? You know, what does this mean for, you know, all of these, you know, kind of Oregon structures of how much notice you have to give an employee before we oh. close? Like, these are all HRE things. But from an op standpoint, what was going through your mind when the world just kind of stopped spinning yeah. for a few weeks? 
You know, well, so many things, and you hit so many of them. But one of the things that stopped for, or that hit both from an ops perspective as well as just from a total organizational perspective mm -hmm. is number one, our employees are essential workers. How do you keep people safe? Right. When you sit in a business where you have dining rooms, drive throughs, yes. digital, you have constant contact with humans. With human beings. All day long, every day. What do you do? Do you literally, I mean, we were talking about do we stay open as business? That's do we close the doors? That's right. Because in the very early days, none of us knew what PPP even really was. I mean, we weren't even in mask mandates at that point. We weren't. You, it was hand sanitizer that and was like, like, try not to catch it. I mean, literally, like, like, it was bare minimum. When you open the door, yes. when somebody's coming, I mean, there, yes. were, there was no PPE. Folks were showing up in the workplace, crossing their fingers that they wouldn't, you know, carry yes. disease to their loved ones. Yes. Right? We didn't even know if it, it impacted babies or, you know, we had none of that information on the front end. I mean, girl, <laughs> I'm listening to you right now talk about PPE. Um, what were some of the? Do you remember some of the convers <laughs> some of the conversations we had about PPE sure. once the mask ma the mask mandate came out? Yep. All of the shelves were clear. Yep. In addition to trying to figure out how to get hand hand sanitizer. Yep. Toilet paper. Gloves. Gloves. Yep. There was a run on all of that in our supply chain. I mean, to your point, a couple of the crazy parts of that. Even before we started, again, I kind of go back to our proactivity, mm -hmm. right? It, that was a uh, principle that we declared literally day one of all of this. And we moved, you know, we went into our supply chain. We tried to get as much as we could in terms of precaution. I remember your reports. <laughs> there just was, I mean, and for all the right reasons, it was, you know, being deployed to hospital staff and frontline workers right. of a different caliber that were actually handling sick people in and, I mean, we were inundated everywhere. everywhere. And so as a 40 location burger chain with at the time 1500 employees, right. how do you keep them protected? Yes. And you know, what's interesting about the mask mandate is we actually moved towards providing masks before it became a mask mandate. Yes. If you remember. I do remember. I remember you all coming forward and saying, you know, there, we were trying to get the masks. Yep. You couldn't find any of the masks. You said, there was no mask mandate. It was being debated, mm -hmm. openly being mm -hmm. debated. And I remember you being on the call and saying, with HR and ops and um, uh, what's, what's, what's John's? Um, John I, Fredericks, the head of QHSE. Right, yep. so qu quality and health. And yeah. Everybody's on the call, we're debating, and you cut through it. I remember it nearly as like, clear as day. You were like, we're getting masks. Everyone will have a mask because it keeps people safe. Yes. And we all looked at each other and said, okay, so we're getting masks. <laughs> We're getting masks, we're getting them today. All right, gang, let's just uh, get them today. And then uh, we come back maybe 15 hours later because we were working around the clock at that oh, time. Yeah. And we all said, there are no masks. <laughs> no, not anywhere. Not one mask. No. There was no elastic. There was no barely any material. <laughs> do you remember that? I was buying hair ties. Like, yeah, no, Girl. there was nothing. And then do you remember what you said? You sent me a text message. No, it was after the fact when we were like in a crisis of like, okay, we gotta keep our people safe. There are no masks. What do we do? And then you, you texted me and you were like, hey, what do you think about hiring a sewing circle? Sure enough. And I was like, say it again? <laughs> You're like, what? Say what now? What are you talking about? <laughs> with, with the emojis, question mark, with a face, like what? And, um, and you were like, what if, what if we can get like, you know, some, some really good seamstress, you know, some, some folks who, you know, maybe a little older, maybe they don't work right now, maybe, maybe they can, she can do, I said, I think I know someone. You remember this? I do. It was so great. So to your point, I remember you, you're like, oh, I know some church ladies who will do this. Oh, I've got this. And it was like, in an instant, you were reaching out to, I believe your mother-in-law? My mother-in-law, Mama McGee. Mama McGee, Mama McGee, right, exactly. And she had already, she was like, oh, I've got ladies. That's we, right. We're going to get this. Give us the materials. Bring us the materials. We'll get it done. And then I was like, oh, sweet, this is going to happen. Done. Well, then you go looking for materials. It took us almost a week and a half to, to get them. It was insane. I was literally refreshing my browser at Joanne Fabrics for an entire day trying to get elastic, trying to get fabric remnants, like driving all around. I was deep in Hillsborough. I was like all over Girl. the Portland metro area trying to find scraps of material and hair ties. Hair ties. You remember you make that work? Yes. Like, what are we supposed to do with these hair ties? I remember the church lady said, what are we supposed to do with these hair ties? I'm like, can you cut them? Like, let's just think outside the box, ladies. 
you got this. And they were like, I don't know. Uh, you know, they, they, and they, they, they were really cranky. They were like, I don't know about this. You know, we'll, we'll see, we'll <laughs> see. You know, I don't, I don't know. Um, but, but we got him. And we got him. We got him in like four days. Those oh, yeah. ladies were working night and day. One lady asked for a break. She was like, you know, I need a break. I think I'm... <laughs> I think I'm gonna take a day off. I said, ma'am, take a day. <laughs> oh my gosh, do you remember? I do, and it's crazy because when we made that move, you know, for me personally, moving to masks early mm -hmm. made sense because, well, and you know, maybe to back up a little bit, but I've had the amazing opportunity of traveling and having a global career. Mm -hmm. So I've spent a ton of time in Asia. I lived in Japan. I spent innumerable numbers of months in China. So masks were always prevalent Coming. when people had colds, mm -hmm. there was smog, there was allergies, et cetera. So for me, when, especially being in the Pacific Northwest with close proximity to many Asian countries that celebrate the usage of masks, the idea that that was an opportunity that could protect people seems so, dare I say, easy? I mean, yes, complicated to achieve, but right. it just seemed like the right move to make. So was that the reason? Is that how you cut through all the chatter so fast? For me, yes. Because it was like a bright line, like, <laughs> we're getting masks, go time. And I'm like, dang, CNN just, like, what is it, Dr. Fauci just said, maybe it might be a good idea. We're doing it, we're doing done. it. I said, it's done. Yeah. It's done. Yeah. And that for me, I mean, also I, I, I think during that time period, we were trying to figure out what is the right path. So we also went after the things that we knew, at least science were saying in the early days, That's right. could help. That's right. um, and we just went for it. So the, so the church sewing circle, kudos to them. Those ladies are forever, I am forever, ever, ever grateful for them because they really tipped us into that first wave of being able to protect our employees. And then we just kept our foot on the gas with PPE um, so that everybody could be as safe as possible. Right on. And then along the way, we had to, to your point, come up with all new policies, procedures, and processes that from an ops standpoint, we just didn't have. I mean, we, as a restaurant company, you have very sound food handling, right. food safety, mm -hmm. quality, sanitation. assurance, sanitation, mm -hmm. safety, tons of that. And that's our, you know, modus operandi in terms of like, that's just how we work. That's right. You layer on COVID, that's a whole other level And of, people not being able to work next mm -hmm. to each other. I mean, from an ops standpoint, oh, yeah. When you all were bringing in some of the challenges, I mean, just just share some of the challenges, please, yeah. with folks that, from an operation standpoint, the, like the physical space itself, what were you all trying to deal with during that time? Well, for uh, across our entire fleet of locations, no single restaurant is the same. Mm -hmm. So that alone is really challenging because you don't have a standardized template that you can step into and say, here's where you stand, here's where you stand, here's where you stand, you never cross, yeah. right? I mean, it's a fast food environment. Mm -hmm. We pride ourselves on making sure that our guest service is excellent and our food ser our food um, quality and creation is excellent. Mm -hmm. How do you do that when you have to be apart from one another and you can't layer and overlap that process? Right. So really quickly we started to, okay, what does it look like to be socially distant in a workplace environment that is literally people adjacent to one another like a supply chain? Right. So we started to really educate our employees yeah. and make sure to guide them, not only with the policies and procedures and principles that we wanted to employ, but really what was best for them mm -hmm. to keep themselves, yeah. their colleagues, their friends, their peers, and their families as safe as possible. So from the beginning, we went with temperature checks, we had daily logs, we had um, social distancing reminders in every single restaurant, gloves, face masks, you know, the, the sky's the limit. And so we've really been taking those foundational principles that we instituted yeah. early on and just have kept them going all the way through this process and refining and improving them as we go. Absolutely. John and his team, I mean, oh, stellar. What, what they were doing with Monoma County, watching him, right, come and educate us on what the new best practices were and just then trying to create policy around it and you trying to create operations and you and your team trying to create operations yeah. around it. Um, and as I've sat down and just kind of thought about the 2020 year and how all of these different groups, right, from the marketing team to the, you know, uh, the, the, all of the administrative functions, HR, the operations side, the quality and health assurance side, everyone coming together nearly every single night to get an update on the current state and for you to say, okay, here were the challenges from the workforce's standpoint recently. How do we codify this new policy? 
Does this mean we have to delete the last policy? I mean, every day it felt different. It did. Right? Yeah. I mean, to your point, I've never worked for the Pentagon, but I really felt like we were a little bit in like the operating, you know, like the war room of how are we going to stay open? How will we keep people safe? How do we iterate our policies and procedures with information coming out every single day and sometimes conflictual, depending upon where you were getting your inputs? And we, because we span two states, Oregon and Washington, you also have to be up to speed on both. And both. Thankfully, we, we were they different. were a lot. They were different They were different at first because yeah. remember Washington was Absolutely. like on it yep. and then Oregon was a little bit delayed. Uh -huh. So we were sitting there arguing, saying like, we're just gonna take the more pro, the, the more um, hyper uh, healthy yes. uh, of the two, yeah. right? So that no matter what, we were always in compliance and in, in compliance and, and sometimes ahead yeah. of the of the pack. Absolutely. What you all did with that was just, and, and being responsive to the workforce, because remember, the workforce was coming to your ops folks, right? Your GMs, um, general managers and assistant managers, et cetera, team managers, and they were saying, we don't feel safe. Yes. We want to see these things improve. Yes. How did ops respond to that? Yeah, it was an every moment, every day thing. I mean, communication, constantly. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the the irony of, of moving into this space was it almost gave us, we always are looking for new and, and interesting ways to engage our employees. Right. Well, I didn't hope for COVID to be that by any means, but right on. here it is. Mm -hmm. And it, give, it gave us, honestly, a pipeline into making sure that we were having communication and conversation with every single employee. All the time. All the like, time. Consistently. Every new day. policies, new protocols, yep. new systems, um, new practices uh, all the time. And I think I think that's what made the workforce feel a little safer in a space where we all felt unsafe, yes. right? We all were uncertain and felt unsteady yes. at times. So just kind of major shout out there. Can we, can we pivot a bit? Sure. I want to talk about some of the hard decisions, the hard calls, right? The logistics were a nightmare. This yeah. is true. But we just had to kind of plan our way out of that. Um, but some hard calls also had to be made um, as things started to shift and uh, look more ominous uh, as COVID descended upon us. There were some personnel decisions that had to occur. I mean, you you basically had to explore if you were going to stay open or close. Yes. Right? I want to walk people through what that process looked like, what that discussion looked like, what the thought, the thinking was, you know, um, from, you know, the intersection of the workforce uh, and, and the operations of fueling the company what what was going through your mind what that process looked like what happened mm -hmm. it's a great question so much simultaneously um you know for again a 40 location burger chain burgers fries and shakes chain that has 40 different and unique locations i think at that point we hadn't closed any yet so i think we were still at 40 or 41 at the time and one of the things that we realized right out of the gate was we're gonna have to change our operating model. Mm. Full stop. Like, what does this mean? Will people still come to a restaurant? Right. We nobody. We didn't know in those early days if people would still even be able, if restaurants would even stay open. Right. We hadn't gotten that guidance yet from the state mm. that we were able to. And our primary business um, channels at that point were in dining, or uh, in restaurant dining, mm -hmm. and drive through. Right. And we had a tiny, tiny baby you know, burgeoning uh, digital business. That's right. And at the time we were like, okay, what do we know? What do we know right now? And what do we need to do? We knew that drive throughs could stay open and we knew that digital could work. We knew that we had to close the dining rooms because not only were restaurants shutting down at that point, you know, following that, but along the lines of being proactive, we could not guarantee that we could keep our employees and our guests safe mm -hmm. if the dining room stayed open. Right. So we closed those day one. And it actually helped us reorient to our priorities, mm -hmm. which were the drive-through. And at the time, our digital business was tiny. I mean, you know, two, three percent of our total business right. in 2020. Right? I mean, we all have digital everywhere, right? right. Um, and so we doubled down on focusing on those two channels. Mm -hmm. And some of the challenges of that were that we needed to get caught up right. and we needed to focus on what does this mean for our employees. Right. When you close down a major business channel in your location, that's gonna have an impact for employees. 
we didn't have enough jobs for people. We knew that- And you had safety parameters. We did have safety parameters, right? you, yeah. you, um, Folks went in there with blue tape, green tape? What color was that tape? Blue, yeah. Blue <laughs> tape, and they put X's to say, like, you could not, you know, function, literally operate the store, the restaurant, as you had in the past, yes. right? So t tell us about how, you know, that, what did that look like? When, when, when you sat down and explored the reality of this new reality, mm -hmm. how, how did you go about making the decisions on, you know, to stay open or to close, right? Because you, you know, your mission is to serve with love. Your mission is to feed people, right? Healthy food. Even though it's a cheeseburger, I feel like I'm the smartest cheeseburger eater on the planet Earth <laughs> because I'm eating at Burgerville. Well, let's be clear. You are anyway, but plus <laughs> like, because I'm not, I'm like eating a health like this. Yeah. I know this cow. This cow was local. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. was sustainable. Yeah. She was a lovely person, right? <laughs> she was happy, and um, and then and now you know I'm getting good vibes as a result of it. So your function in our community was so important, right? The people who were working themselves tirelessly, working themselves to death to go into these hospitals, to, to take care of their, their, their families, trying to figure out how to feed everybody who's now all in the same house. How did you, you know, balance that, feeding the community, serving the community, the love that they, and the nourishment that they really needed? Mm -hmm. Keeping your workforce safe and recognizing that your entire business has pivoted in some fundamental ways and revenue has been... All right. projections are scrapped. Exactly. What is going through your mind, yeah. Katie? <laughs> what was going through our minds? I mean, again, I go, I go to how do we stay proactive? Does that mean that we stay open? And what do we need to do to do that to provide as many jobs as possible to keep feeding our guests? To your point, essential workers, they, they didn't have anywhere to go to eat. I mean, legit, like they couldn't. And this was before everybody was online ordering right. takeout, right? right? I mean, this was day one, and we knew that if we stayed open, we could still be a destination for families, yes, right? right? Schools closed. Yeah. Where were people gonna be eating? So for us, it really became, we're a community-built organization. Mm -hmm. That is, I actually think it might even be on my T-shirt. Yep, right here, a sweatshirt, community-built. Community built. We stand for community at every turn, mm -hmm. and we knew that we played a really pivotal role in feeding our communities healthy food and in having access by nature of having drive throughs and digital and by being accessible in price point. Yes. And the combination of all of those things really not only helped us pivot towards the future of like, okay, what's this gonna mean? And our future was day to day, right? Yes. It was not where are we gonna be in a year? It was, oh, let's hopefully help Helpful, hopefully we will make it through this next quarter, right? Right. But none of us knew and nobody knew what the financial impacts were going to be. Nobody knew if people would keep coming to the restaurant. Um, nobody knew if people were out of fear going to stay home. I'm stressed cetera, listening to this right, right now. I know, <laughs> my, I'm getting a little warm in here. Um, but the reality was the unknowns were, in, I mean, they were just insane. And so we just kept on moving forward. And when a new thing would pop up, we take tackle it head on and figure out a way to iterate. And even like even little minor things that became major discussions. How do you hand someone's credit card to them in the drive-through? Do you touch that? Do you not? Do you take cash? How do you have an exchange? Like how do you have customer service when you don't interact face to face anymore? So for us, just even assessing literally every touch point on the guest journey from the moment they come to Burgerville to the moment they enjoy their meal was something we had to look underneath every single rock to, to be able to be, you know, even remotely come out the other side, but just move day to day throughout the, the months in front of us. Yep. Yep. And so when you all were together and exploring, like, how many employees can we retain? How many employees, um, um, you know, what are the assessing the employee skill sets. I remember having that, you know, that conversation. If we've got limited staff, <clears throat> they've got to be able to, to, to utilize more of the different, oh, more of the areas of the organization or, or of the company, of the restaurant. Um, I remember you all coming and saying, they have to be able to do shakes. They have to be able to do the grill. They've got to be able to do the register. They have to be able to do all those things mm -hmm. and do them well. Mm -hmm. Because you had to do a reduction in your force, which was in the news. It was in the media. What, what what was what was that like? Like what what went through your minds? I mean, I know that, you know, I made some of the calls with you all. We all said, you know, got on the phone. We got our list of people um, that we had to call and let them know that 
reductions were happening and how it was going to impact them and how we were going to support them as best we could for an extended period of time. But before we even started making those calls, what was the discussion like from the, at the leadership level when the reality that that had to happen, like sunk in? Yeah. I go back to the fact that Burgerville is a community built company and our mission is served with love, right? And we have employees working at Burgerville who have literally been in the company for 35 years. That's right. It is not unheard of to have employees come to Burgerville 15, 16 and still be there at 30, 35 years of age. So for us, it's a huge family. And more often than not, actually a family within a family. Yeah. Multiple members of families work together. Couples work in our organization. Fathers, daughters, you know, mothers, sons, like the whole gamut. And so when we were in that process of trying to figure out what does a reduction in force look like? What does furlough look like? How do we move through this unknown and this time period where we don't know if we'll ever recover from this? What decisions are you willing to make? So to your point, we looked at making sure that we had a nimble workforce. Um, we made sure that we had employees that wanted to really come to work right. um, every day and participate and be all hands on because this we had no idea how exhausting it was going to be either, right? And so you need folks who are ready to jump in and do whatever it takes. And then in addition to that, we were assessing every single day you know, our labor rates. When you're in the restaurant game, you've got two main major inputs in cost. Mm -hmm. You've got food and you've got labor. And when those things start to get out of whack, you, you know, the restaurant game's low margin. <laughs> and, and the profitability takes a lot to squeeze out. And so not that you would ever do that on the backs of people by any means, right. but you have to start assessing, like, how do we make sure that we stay open and operable for the greater good and the majority of our employees. And the it was that, I still actually think about that week often when we had to make those calls and we had to reduce our workforce by 600 people. Man, you from know, what to what? You, you went 1,500 from... to uh, just about right now, we're at about 1,000 people. Right. But at that and, point, that's we took it down to 900. Yeah, right. 900 people. Man. Yeah. It was tough. It, it was sucked. It was really tough to go through that. But I just want to, I want to commend Burgerville for, for surviving. Thank you. There are so many companies, local companies, right? Like places that are staples. We've got stories, right? Like no Centro doesn't exist anymore. We met at, oh, that was the, that's where we met the yes. first time for happy hour at Nell Central 2017, something like that. Yes. Like, Nell Central oh, is no lo longer in existence. It's awful. And Burgerville was able to continue to, to employ and have a workforce and have staff and feed people healthy food options, healthy quick service food options. Shout out to, to you. Shout out to John and Tasha and Hillary and I'm missing names right now, oh, yeah. right? Like Beth and I, I, all of the, the, the entire crew. Yes. Just no crew. Like I've got so much respect for you and the Herculean effort to just get this thing on track to, to exist right now. Yeah. You know, to your point, Cyrilda, when you look at an organization that can not only weather a storm like COVID, adapt on the fly, and start to put together now a plan for the future, that is 100% because of the talent and the um, fortitude in every single employee. I didn't do that, right? Right. Wasn't me alone by any means. It, crew showing up every day. What every is a burger day? without crew? Nothing. We are not open. We got, we got no sandwiches. They are the economic, I mean, literally, they are the engine of the company, the heart and the soul. Absolutely. And the reality of it is we have stellar talent in the organization from the crew all the way to our CEO. And when we have a common goal slash enemy called COVID, we go to work. And that's what we did. And I am, you know, one of the things that um, it was really interesting part of this conversation, to your point on what we did operationally was, you know, you're starting, at that point, you're also surveying all of your competitors. What are my competitors doing? 
how are they surviving? What are they doing? And whether it's a competitor that is, you know, somebody that you consider to be like-minded to you in terms of mission and vision, or somebody who has the same, call it operational nuance to you, like a fast food restaurant, you assess all of that. And the thing that was very clear to us during that time period was that we wanted to make sure that we stuck to our vision and our mission, mm. that we didn't erode who we were, that we were empathetic and authentic that yeah. entire time. And whatever came as a result of honestly going high instead of going low during that time period was going to be. And as long as we had integrity in what we did, we could all live with the decisions that we were making. Yes. Were they brutal? Absolutely. Have we recovered from all of them? No, we haven't. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. And, but yet to your point, we are still here and we are still moving forward and we're excited to start to even consider and rebuild our strategic plan for 2021 and beyond. Man, I'm, I'm excited for that. And I'm, I'm, again, I cannot say enough how much respect I have for the hard decisions that you had to make, but the way you went about making those decisions. Thank you. Right. So, Katie, speaking of morale, right, your workforce, our workforce, quite frankly, the nation, the world has been through a lot. How's morale right now? How are folks doing? And, and, and what's been your approach and response to trying to help with morale as much as humanly possible? Yeah. You know, morale is up and down, to be honest with you. Um, I think people are tired. I think they're worn out. I think the stress levels of just living during this year have been overwhelming. Um, I am incredibly thankful and grateful and proud to see our employees rally every single day, even when they don't frankly want to, or they're tired, or they are concerned. Um, and it's just been, it's been a roller coaster. Of emotion. Um, I will say too that going into this fall, which usually after we come off of a, a big high summer of mm -hmm. berries and walla wallas, and I know we're going to talk food, so once I get there, I'm going to lay it all out there. But yeah. um, you know, we usually kind of come and settle a little bit as we go into winter, mm -hmm. which have shorter days and darker nights, and you know, kids back to school, etc. And right. this year just didn't have any of those kind of normal. Um, markers mm -hmm. in our seasonality or markers in our calendar. Yeah. So I think for folks, it's felt like a quite a bit, and I know for myself, a run on sentence. It just keeps <laughs> on going. Oh, I like that analogy. A right? Because you're sentence. just kind of like, oh, here we are again. No Let's pauses, crisis no manage this one. Just, Nothing. Oof. Just keeps on going. And I know Burgerville has also been exploring and considering extending, right? The offering, the, the learning and development mm -hmm. offerings to more of the, of the workforce, which is super exciting. One of the things that you did not highlight that I think Burgerville did incredibly well, that, that, that I think had a pretty significant impact on lowering some of the anxieties of the workforce, mm. and that was communicating early and often. Yes. The, the level of transparency of the decisions of the 7 a.m. calls, and then summarizing, you know, um, Hillary, myself, you, so many people like getting in there and saying, what, what are the highlights? What are the things that are gonna directly impact our workforce, let's be transparent with them about the why. Let's be transparent with them about, you know, what the, what the outcome of this why is going to yeah. be. And um, I also think that that did a little bit to kind of calm them when they were at the highest peaks of stress, specifically yes. early and um, early to, to hell late, mm -hmm. early to late uh, COVID. And then also when the fires hit, especially when yes. those fires came out, everyone was looking every morning to see what were we going to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, great job. Not a lot of companies communicate with their workforce in that way. And, Thank you. And you all, um, and quite honestly, I don't know that, that that was the cadence of communication two years ago, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so that early and often approach is something that I think is now kind of ingrained and, and you know, embedded into the DNA now of Burgerville, yes. which I think is beautiful. Yeah. To your point, early and often, and once you step into that space, you have to keep generating. That's right. And, you know, when you were asking me a little bit about who I am and how I came to Burgerville, yes, creative strategy is my love, yeah. but leading people is my passion. Right on. And that part for me is I don't know how to be any other way than be in and in the trenches with the employees. That's right. So I know what I want to know. I know how I'd want to be communicated mm -hmm. with. I'm constantly reminding myself and our teams to be in the shoes of our audience, which are employees. Yep. And they, for any company, 
are your most important and most precious asset. A so if absolutely. You, if you're not nurturing that, then it doesn't matter how good your product or service is, you're never gonna survive anyway. So you and I have been on this journey together for almost the entire time we both have been at Burgerville, yeah. and I could not have imagined a better partner. I honestly, Cyrilda, and I say this from the bottom of my heart, would have been way over my skis, <laughs> like falling down the mountain, eating all of it, uh, if I didn't have a partner like you. Yeah. I mean, you kept us ahead of the curve in terms of policies, procedures, processes, but even more importantly, the people and the culture part. My final question for you today is, girl, Burgerville's food is delicious, <laughs> right? And I, you know I'm not like, Shining you on here. Yep, yep. Because I say it all the time. Yep. Like, oh my gosh, I wouldn't got this, you know, seasonal, you know, special, and it is fantastic. I've gone five times this week, right? Yes. Um, what do y'all do to make this food so spectacular? Like, for real, what, what is the secret sauce? What, give us a little insider information. Oh, I love that question. Well, our insider information is not only what Burgerville does with that food, mm -hmm. but is the supply chain. Right on. The reality of it is we, again, have stood for local and sustainable for decades. And that is what makes our food from the very foundational part of what we do stellar. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we get to partner with some of the best in the business, from Country Natural Beef to Corey Carmen at Carmen Ranch to Sealy Mint to all of our berry suppliers and our Walla Walla onion ring suppliers. Like we Tillamook have cheese is also oh all Tillamook right. cheese, Face Rock, Grand Central. Like uh, we get to partner with all you the Grand Central. We do, yeah. Oh my gosh, is we that the, is that the bun? We do, yeah. They make the bun for our number six burger, which yeah. is a burger that we launched just shy of two years ago, which is honestly one of the most show showcased items in our menu. It's a grass-fed, grass-finished burger uh -huh. um, with face rock cheese from Bandon, Oregon, which is out at the coast. And Grand Central makes their amazing bun from small local farmers and growers from all around the region in the Pacific Northwest. So um, for us, the supply chain is the foundation to everything we do. If it's healthy, our food is great and our business mm. is good. In addition to that, you know, our in-house chef and our product and food team. Chef! chef love her. <laughs> you can catch her all the time. She's, she's out there. Um, we love to play with food. Yeah. We've got new specials every single month. We love to celebrate both, you know, different kinds of burgers that we can make to specialty fries mm. to shakes. We're really doubling down on shakes because, I mean, who doesn't love ice cream in December? I will eat it all the time. I will eat it tonight. <laughs> You know, like, I want a new shake in December, so. Yes, I do. So, yeah, you know, we've really been able to stand for our supply chain. And, you know, it's interesting because even this whole year, if you look at a lot of our competitors, one of the things that a lot of um, fast food and quick service restaurants did was they, short, they, they made their menu smaller uh -huh. to make it easier right. and more efficient. Makes sense. Well, for us, when we make those choices, there are ripple effects yeah. in our regional economy. Because if you start to take things off the menu, like your favorite, the wild Alaskan halibut sandwich. That sandwich, that halibut sandwich, right? if you haven't had it. I know that you love that. You start Ooh, the to- the chicken sandwich, I put bacon on it. I, as you should. Because you have that thick bacon. As you like, should. You have the real bacon, oh, like yeah. that Costco bacon, right? Like, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm hungry, I don't know. No, okay. we will be after this for <laughs> sure. Um, and we didn't, we didn't, we chose to keep our menu as intact as possible because we knew that if we started to make changes there, that ripple effect to our supply chain was going to be real. Yeah. Think about most of our supply chain feeds all of the local restaurant industry too, mm -hmm. right? We don't, we don't buy a lot of our product from big mass ag suppliers. Right. So if Corey Carmen's selling beef to us, she's also selling it to restaurants around town. When they close, she loses a portion of her business. Right. So for us, it was really important to stay as intact as possible so that we could manage the disruptions in our supply chain as best that we could and wow. support them for their long-term viability because when they're not successful, we're not successful. And that is a partnership and a marriage we are integrally uh, connected to and making investments into the future around. Man, I just have to say, the impact, right? I, I'd always eaten Burgerville, right? It's a local staple, right? It's just when you come to, to Oregon, to Portland, you try yeah. Burgerville, right? Yeah. But it wasn't until I started working with directly with the entire organism, the organism of 
of Burgerville that I recognize the impact that you all have on this region and your supply chain and, and the rippling uh, effect that it has. And I just want to say it has been such a pleasure to work with you in this work. Thank you. It has been such a pleasure to reimagine how human resources is uh, operationalized throughout Burgerville. It has been, you know, my like a pride of mine to be on those calls at six o'clock in the morning yeah. and seven o'clock in the morning with you all. Like, thank you for the partnership. Thank you. And thank you for just testing out some of my theories and giving me a shot when it was unorthodox. And yeah. Really allowing me to take up some space and being my most authentic self because I know Burgerville got the best version of Cyrilda that I had to offer because of leadership like yours and Jill's and Bill and Tasha and the rest of the folks All the on heroes. the op side and the marketing side and John making sure that we were we were compliant, <laughs> compliant, OSHA compliant, yep, right? Yep. Multnomah County compliant. I mean, he he made he was just doing phenomenal things, and I can't I can't say enough about him. And you know, Christina and the HR team and Raquel, just like oh my gosh, yeah. I don't even have enough time to give all the shout outs that I want to give to to the people who who made Burgerville work during some you know unstable rocky times and made it fun at times too. Like yeah. there was some just good vibes. I agree. And I appreciate that back at you because, you know, one of the things we started a year ago, I mean, honestly, January of last year, when we had a different strategic plan than we have now, right? right? We were on brand turnaround. We were on doubling down on guest experience. Yes. We were on making sure it's an, a fair and equitable place to work. To we bottom. were like looking under every rock. And one of the things now that we're, we're reorienting our strategic plan, right? You gotta throw out the old one and start fresh. You know, we are so excited to still stand for this brand and have some really new and exciting things to talk about and celebrate. Um, again, it's our 60th year, so we're gonna have years. birthday vibes all year long. Um, I'm super impressed with our brand and marketing team because not only have they been able to pivot us towards new business models, i.e. like digital, but also have doubled down on up-leveling the brand experience. And that plus supply chain, plus amazing employees, plus phenomenal guests mm -hmm. and just delicious food. <laughs> delicious food and just being and celebrating being a hometown favorite that's still here and viable going into 21 and beyond is one of the greatest, honestly, like experiences in my entire career. And I feel blessed to have had a very dynamic and dimensional career. But this year alone has taught me so much partnering with you has taught me so much. And I actually am really excited about what's to come for us as a brand and what's to come for us as a regional economic developer in the Pacific Northwest. Right on, all right. Well, gang, this is the conclusion of Word on the Street. Thanks for, for joining us here today. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel, connect with us on LinkedIn. The entire Workplace Change family has you know, is honored to be a part of the Burgerville family. And uh, we are so grateful for Katie Reardon, Chief Operating Officer at Burgerville, coming to spend a little bit of her time today. Have a great day.